One aspect of investing that always puzzles people is there are lots of investment strategies that seem to make money on paper. In other words, you look at the hypothetical portfolios, they deliver 5, 10, 15 percent more than the market. But then when you look at practice, you look at the actual returns that investors deliver, it's far lower than what you saw on paper. And the biggest reason for that is I think we tend to underestimate how much of a drag on returns trading costs become. So in this session, what I'd like to do is talk about what trading costs are, because it's far more than that $8.95 that you might spend putting the, bid, the, the trade in. Trading costs are a much bigger item than that, and how much of a drag they can put on your portfolio. Because depending on what you invest in, trading costs can be trivial or they can be huge. So let's talk about the components of trading costs. There is, of course, the brokerage costs, which 30 or 40 years ago might have been substantial because you had to call your broker and he had to trade for you and you would charge based on what he thought was reasonable. Today, most of us are online. We can trade for uh, almost nothing. So the brokerage costs have decreased to the point where there aren't that many differences between big investors and small investors. But there are three other costs we tend to ignore when we think about trading costs. The first is what's called the bid-ask spread. Basically, the price at which you can buy a stock and sell the stock at the same point in time is not the same. So the bid price and the ask price will often be different, which means if you buy a stock and change your mind instantaneously, sell it back, you're going to lose some money. How much will depend on the magnitude of the spread. The second is the price impact. Hey, you're saying, well, how much of a price impact? If you're, if you're a small investor, you might not have to worry. A thousand shares, a hundred shares. But if you're an investor owning a hundred thousand shares or a million shares, when you try to trade those shares, when you try to buy shares or sell shares, you have a price impact. As you buy the shares, you push the price up. As you sell the shares, you push the price down. And as a consequence, you tend to see lower returns for what you might observe on paper by looking at the actual listed price. And there's a final cost, which is... If you worry about price impact and you hold back on trading, there's an opportunity cost to waiting. By waiting, not only might your returns get lower, you might actually lose the opportunity to trade. And that factor is, should, has to be weighed in somewhere in this process as well as part of the trading costs. So let's start with some very simple evidence that there's a trading cost drag. All you need to do is look at the collective return that active money managers, active money managers are managers who go out and try to pick stocks and they have a variety of philosophies. But if you look across all active money managers and you compare the returns they make to the returns you'd have made on index funds on the index itself, you get a difference of about one and a half percent. That one and a half percent, you can argue, is basically the collective drag created by trading costs by investors. So basically, when you see that one, one and a half, two percent less returns that active money managers make, collectively, that has to be the total cost of trading in all its different forms. That's a pretty substantial cost. There's actually some very, very significant evidence on trading costs, and this comes from looking at a couple of very, very simple stories. The first was an attempt by ValueLine. ValueLine is, um, is a long-standing investment survey. It's been around 50 years with a fairly good rep reputation. In fact, anybody who's seen a ValueLine ad, and most of us have if we browse through business magazines, the ad basically highlights the stocks that are classified as timeliness five, the very best stocks on the value line scale. And the graph shows that if you invested in these stocks, you'd have made this dramatic return over and above what you'd have made investing in the S&P 500. So see the red line here? That's actually the return you'd have made on paper from investing in the value line. That looks pretty impressive, right? Look at how much it rises between 1976 and 1991. But, uh, or 1978 and 91. But in the late 70s, Valueline actually decided to create a real fund whose job was going to be to invest in those stocks that they were sending out as in their surveys as timeliness five stocks. In other words, they were going to go from just survey people who gave advice to investors to actually running a mutual fund. Big mistake. Because that value line fund that invested supposedly in the same timeliness five stocks, that's their return. So there's the blue line. That's a paper return. I'm sorry, the red line. That's a pay return on paper. The blue line is the actual return that value line delivered. See why the difference? There's transactions cost. So in paper, it looks great. But when value line tried to invest based on its own timeliness five recommendations, it didn't look like the actual returns matched up 
to that those paper returns. So that's a cautionary note about the magnitude of transactions cost. So let's dig a little deeper. Let's take the items of transactions cost that comprise transactions cost and look at what drives them. Let's start with the bid ask spread. The bid ask spread basically represents the fact that there's a dealer or a market maker who has to kind of smooth this process, allow the trading to continue. And there are three types of costs that that dealer has to face that he somehow has to cover. The first is, if you're a true dealer, you don't want to hold any shares. I mean, you don't want to be having any of your capital tied up in inventory, but whether you like it or not, you often will. And that costs you. So you've got to pass that cost on. The second is there is a cost of processing orders, maybe less now than it was 10 or 20 years ago because technology helps, but there's a processing cost. And there's a third cost. A dealer left to himself is often trading against investors who might be more informed than he is. And if he's not careful, he's going to find himself losing money to these more informed investors. So there's cost of holding inventory, cost of processing orders, cost of trading with more informed investors. So what does the dealer have to do? He has to set the bid ask spread large enough that it covers these costs. In fact, if you dig a little deeper you and you look across companies and you look across companies even with, let's start with the US. If you look across US stocks, you notice that the spread as a percentage of the stock price varies widely across stocks. And there are, here are some of the factors that seem to cause them to vary. One is liquidity. Very, very liquid stocks, the spread can be a tiny fraction of the price. So if you trade IBM, for instance, the spread can be $0.10 cents and the stock, stock price can be $200, basically making the bid-ask spread almost, almost zero. The bid-ask spread, however, starts to increase as you go to less liquid companies. So if you go to the smaller NASDAQ stocks that might not see much trading, the spread on the stock might be $0.50, cents, the price might be $2, which gives you a bid-ask spread of 25% of the stock price. That's a pretty big difference. The spreads also tend to vary depending on who owns the stock. For whatever reason, stocks with a lot of institutional activity, if, if, if you see a surge in institutional activity, tend to see a, an increase in bid-ask spreads. Perhaps this might be because the dealer looks at those institutions trading with them and he says, they must know something I don't. He might be right or wrong about it, but for whatever reason, if there's a surge in institutional activity, spreads seem to go up. So I'm not saying stocks with a lot of institutional activity have higher spreads, but I'm saying if, this, if the institutional activity kicks up, there seems to be an increase in the spread. Third, riskier uh, stocks seem to have higher bid ask spreads than safer stocks, perhaps because the stock price can move a lot more and put the dealer at risk. The biggest factor, though, that, that determines the spread as a percentage of the price is the level of the price. If you buy a low price stock, I can almost guarantee you that the spread you're going to face as a percentage of the price is going to be higher than if you buy a high price stock. That's why I gave you the example of IBM, $200 stock price, the spread is going to be tiny because the price level is so high. So if you buy low price stocks, don't be surprised to see the spread increase as a percentage of the stock price. The spread also seems to be a function of how transparent information is in corporate governance. Companies with weaker corporate governance and more opaque information structures tend to have larger bid ask spreads. And that's no surprise because everybody's unsure about who you're trading with and because there's so much opacity, you as a dealer worry that the person you're trading with knows a lot more than you. And finally, the exchange or the market structure seems to matter. In fact, there was this well-known study that created a whole, a whole lot of change about 20 years ago about NASDAQ which came and, and, and NYSE stocks had looked at difference in exchanges and noticed that spreads were sticky in exchanges. In other words, spreads were, unu were, were, uncom were unusually around quarters, halves. You never saw spreads at 10, 10 cents, 20 cents, which led to some changes. You know, decimalization, smaller spreads. But the structure of the market can make a difference as well as to what the size of the spread is. So let's look at how, how much spreads vary across stocks. This is a fairly old study, but I think it kind of brings home the point about how much bid-ask spreads can vary across stocks. So what you find on, the, on one axis, basically the yellow line, is the, per, the spread as a percentage of the price. Okay? So basically the axis is on this side, so you can see the spread as a percent of the price. No. And on the other axis, you're, you, I basically have classified companies from smallest to largest. So let's see how we'd read it. The smallest companies, the bid-ask spread as a percent of the price, at least based on the study, is about 7% of the stock price. 
The largest companies, the bid as spread is down to a half a percent. So small market cap stocks tend to have much bigger bid ask spreads than large market cap stocks. So if you have a strategy that requires you to invest in a lot of small companies, don't be surprised if your actual returns lag your paper returns because think of how much of your money you're leaving on the table because of the bid ask spread. So if you look at the variation in spreads across U.S. stocks, here, the, the, in addition to all of the things we talked about, here are the three variables that seem to drive the spread the most. One, as I said, is the price level. Lower price stocks have higher spreads than higher price stocks. Okay. Second is trading volume. The more liquidity there is in a stock, more trading volume, the lower the spread tends to be. The third is the ownership structure. Okay. As insider holdings climb as a percentage of the total stock outstanding, bid as spreads tend to increase. This may seem contradictory to what I said earlier about institutional trading, but that was about changes in institutional trading. Holding all else constant, though, if you have a stock where 80% of the stock is held by insiders, don't be surprised to see larger spreads on that stock than if 90% is held by institutions. Now, if you look across markets, you'll start to see how much liquidity varies across mar markets. So in this table, for instance, you see a co the country in the first column. You see the average bid-ask spread in the second column. Notice how much it varies across countries. So in fact, uh, in China, the spread is only 0.31%, whereas in the Philippines, it's 6.61%. But that's partly explained by turnover, which tells you how much trading you see in these markets, and partly by the number of days in each of these markets where you see zero trading volume on a stock. So as an example, if you take Russia, there are 40% of days where there's zero trading volume on the stock. Stocks don't trade at all, which tells you that the spreads are going to reflect that lack of liquidity. So bid-ask spreads vary across stocks, they vary across market cap classes, they vary across markets, and all of this has relevance, but it also can vary across time. You take the largest market cap companies, remember we, we talked about the magnitude of the spread being a small number, and most of the time that's true. The spread might be 20 basis point, points or 30 basis It's a very small number until you have a crisis. This is, in fact, a graph of the 2008 crisis and what it did to bid-ask spreads among the largest companies. Take a look at that, that spike. That's basically bid-ask spreads increasing during the crisis, and they stayed up there for about three to four months before they started to see them and before the crisis dissipate and they start to come back down again. So if you're trying to trade in the middle of a crisis, your transactions costs are going to be higher simply because the spreads have widened. And in fact, this was a problem that hedge funds ran into in the late, in late 2008 as they tried to get out of positions. They found that the transactions costs were much greater at the time when they most needed liquidity. So if you think about how much of an effect bid-ask spreads are going to have on your strategy, Part of it is going to depend upon what kinds of companies you invest in. So if you invest in a lot of small cap stocks or low price stocks, so if your strategy leads you in there, you're going to end up with much higher transactions costs because of the size of the bid ask spread. So here's one example. About 25 years ago, there was a very interesting study that looked at a strategy of buying what were called loser stocks. In other words, stocks that have gone down the most in the last year are often the best investments if you look at pure returns going forward. So a study by DeBont and Taylor that showed that if you bought loser stocks, they vastly outperformed winner stocks over the next five years. But that's based on paper returns. There were people who tried to put these these loser stock strategies into practice by going out and buying the 50 biggest loser stocks in the last year. The only problem is if you think about loser stocks, these are the stocks where the prices have dropped the most. They tend to be low price stocks. And if you take the tr the, the bid ask spread on these, uh, on these low price stocks, you find that a big portion of the excess returns that they found in the study get wiped out by the size of the bid ask spread. So don't think of the trading cost as a side cost. It's going to be a central component in whether you make returns on your particular strategy. So that's the first stop. That's bid ask spreads. Take a look at your strategy. Take a look at what kinds of stocks you're, you're trading, and that'll give you some sense of how much your the bid ask spread will take out of your returns. Second stop in the process is you might have a price impact. Why do you have a price impact? The first is fairly obvious. It's demand supply. If you, if you have an influx of somebody trying to sell 3 million or 5 million shares, there's going to be a price impact because markets are not completely liquid. They can't absorb that sudden surge in either demand or supply. So the first is that markets are not completely liquid. There's a liquidity effect. There's a second impact. If you see somebody trying to sell 5 million shares in a hurry and you're an investor on the floor 
or an investor elsewhere. I would be surprised if you started wondering, why is he trying to sell these shares so quickly? He must know something that I don't. In other words, we read information into trades, and when you see large trades, people assume there's information behind the trade. So if people are trying to buy a large block, they assume there's good news that they know, and if they're trying to sell a large block, they assume there's bad news they're not letting you know. So there's a liquidity impact and an information impact. You're saying, why are you splitting hairs? The liquidity impact will dissipate, right? It dissipates as liquidity comes back. The information impact might stay. In fact, there's a very interesting study from a long time ago that looked at large block trades in the New York Stock Exchange and basically looked at what happens to the price at the time of the block trade and how quickly does the price adjust back. And what the study found was that instantaneously there is an impact. And if, in fact, you could buy the stock right at the block trade price, you could make money. But you had to do it right away. Because if you waited about five or ten minutes after the trade, much of the returns got wiped out. In other words, on the New York Stock Exchange, big block trades on liquid companies, the liquidity effect disappears very, very quickly. So you think, so what's the big deal? If this disappears so quickly, why are we making such a big deal out of it. Well, I think it varies across, again, companies. That liquidity return is, is, is going to be much easier if you're looking at a large market cap stock on the New York Stock Exchange. But if you're trading a small market cap stock, you might find that the liquidity impact lasts a lot longer and the market impact or the price impact is much greater. Here again is a study from a long time ago where um, the author of the study actually tried hypothetical trade. So he basically called brokers and said, I'm going to trade 100,000 shares, 10,000 shares. And he tried it on stocks ranging from large market cap to small market cap stocks. And he recorded what the price impact would have been of the trades. And you can see very quickly, again, the smallest least liquid companies, the price impact is huge, 15, 20, 25 percent. And as you go, and depending on the size of the block, the impact gets much larger for bigger blocks rather than smaller blocks. But again, price impact can vary across companies as a function of the size of the company and the liquidity of the company. So wh why might this impact your investment strategy? Depending on the type of stocks you buy, you're going to find yourself more exposed or less exposed to price impact. If your investment strategy requires you to disproportionately invest in small market cap companies that are less liquid, you're going to see a much larger price impact. And the interesting thing was those are exactly the kinds of stocks which also tended to have large bid ask spreads. So the kinds of stock where you have a big price impact also tend to be the kinds of stocks where the bid ask spread is a big chunk of your trading cost. So basically the two, both costs kind of kick in, taking away your returns. The second factor in your investment strategy is the more your investment strategy requires that you trade quickly. So if you trade, so, so let's say your investment strategy is based on trading on information, buying right after earnings announcements. You can't afford to wait 15 or 20 minutes, and definitely not today. Then you're going to find yourself more exposed to price impact because you have to trade quickly. And thirdly, it depends on the size of your portfolio. And here's one of the few scenarios where being a small investor is better than being a big investor. You're a small investor, you can get away without a price impact. You buy a 1,000 shares, you sell a 1,000 shares, nobody knows, nobody cares. You're Fidelity Magellan, you have to sell a 100 million or a billion dollars worth of a company's stock, you have a much bigger price impact. So if your investment strategy is based on investing billions of dollars and you have to invest in less liquid companies or emerging market companies, remember that the, that the markets which had the biggest bid as spreads, the emerging markets, had, but emerging markets which had the biggest bid as spreads also have the biggest price impact, you're going to find your returns being impacted by that price impact as well. So that's, bid a, the, so that's a bid ask spread and the price impact. Let's look at the third cost. You can wait, right? In fact, if there's no cost to waiting, that's what people would do. There would never be a block trade. You'd break it up into pieces and you wait and sell it in little pieces. So the very fact that there are block trades tells you that there's a cost to waiting. And what's that cost? One is if you wait, you might find yourself giving up some returns. So you found an interesting stock that you think is going to go up. By waiting three days or six days, you might give up a third of the returns you would have otherwise made. The second is, is sometimes the price might rise so much while you're waiting that you might not trade at all. So the cost of waiting is actually tough to quantify because it's often trades not made. But here are some things we know about the cost of waiting. One is it depends on a variety of variables. One, one variable in matter, that, that it depends on is the type of information on which you're basing your trading. 
if the type of information you have has a low sh has, a, has a very short shelf life it's private information it decays while you're sitting on it then you have to trade right away because if you wait somebody else is going to get that information and trade on it so the first thing it's going to depend on is the information you're using private information with a short shelf life or public information which has been out there for months and nobody's doing anything about it if it's a ladder you don't worry as much about waiting second you'll have to worry about how active the inf the market is for information so you're worried about other people looking for the information you have so if you're investing in a stock where hundreds of investors are searching for information you worry about them finding it quickly you have to trade quickly third is is your investment strategy a short-term strategy or a long-term strategy short-term strategies has a much bigger cost to waiting because you, you have to make money quickly so for instance if your strategy is to buy right after earnings announcements and sell three hours later you can't wait because if you wait and much of your returns can get wiped out if your strategy is to buy low PE stocks and hold them for five years not a big deal to wait and finally and this is an interesting phenomenon if your strategy is a contrarian strategy where you're going against the prevailing flow you're selling when everybody else is buying or buying when everybody else is selling you can afford to wait because essentially you might actually be helped by waiting but if your investing strategy is a momentum strategy if you wait the momentum is going to keep going and you're going to give up some of that momentum return that you otherwise would have made so you tell me something about your strategy and I'll tell you how big the cost of waiting is going to be as a side issue I've talked a lot about stocks here but there are trading costs on real assets as well right those trading costs are you know can vary if you're trading commodities you know gold silver diamonds trading costs are fairly small if you're trading real estate and you're actually trading real estate you're not buying and selling REITs or securities you're actually trading you know, physical real estate there's a pretty substantial cost when the real estate brokers and salespeople it can be five six percent of value or greater with all the other costs added in if you're trading fine art or collectibles commissions can be huge 15 20 percent you have to get it appraised you have to get the value estimated so clearly depending on the real asset you're investing in your trading cost can range from a, a couple of percent to a to 25 or 30 percent and part of the reason for that is there are some real real asset markets which are not liquid if they're not liquid you have fewer intermediaries you need more specialized localized knowledge and that all translates into a much higher trading cost in those markets final piece of the puzzle I want to talk about taxes it might seem strange that I'm talking about taxes in the context of trading costs but to me the two are related and you're going to see in a minute why taxes matter but stating the obvious might as well state it. they're all the I mean there if you go back in time and you look at investing in US stocks for instance over the last 85 or 90 years it would be a pretty lucrative exercise a dollar invest in 1928 would have translated into 350 400 450 thousand dollars today so you think that's pretty good but that's on based on pre-tax returns if I attach a tax rate to those returns and I pay my taxes every year look at the drag so I'm sorry the, the dollar invested would have been worth about hundred and sixty three thousand but if I take out taxes and I pay the taxes every year I lose about 75 to 80 percent of that return that's a pretty substantial drag that's created by taxes right that's a little extreme because I'm assuming you pay taxes at the end of every year and it also depends again on whether you receive your returns as dividends or price appreciation right because on dividends I don't have a choice I have to pay taxes in the year that I get them but the price appreciation is very much a function of when I sell the stock and you can see depending on the dividend yields of uh, dividend yield of the index you're investing in you can lose so if you have more dividends you end up losing giving up more of your money and if you have less dividends you basically hold on to more of your money and if you have more price appreciation so it's, and that's because historically dividends were taxed at a much higher tax rate than capital gains that of course is no longer true in the US at least for the moment but you can see how taxes basically take away your returns now let me explain why I talked about this in the context of trading if you look at mutual funds or in fact investment funds in general and you look at how much of your returns from these funds you end up paying in taxes it's very much a function of how much trading these funds do so here for instance I've classified mutual funds in the US into five classes based on turnover ratios turnover ratios represent the trading done in these funds as a function of the value of the fund so a turnover ratio of less than 15 percent basically means that the trading do dollar volume that they did that year was less than 15 percent of the value of the fund so that's a low turnover ratio and at the other extreme you see a turnover ratio greater than 70 percent 
the trading done that year exceeded 70% of the value of the fund. So you see the blue line, the blue line is your pre-tax return, the red line is your after-tax return. So even if you take the lowest turnover funds, your pre-tax return was greater than your after-tax. I mean, it, it, there, there is a drag, but the drag is relatively small. But notice as your turnover ratio goes up, how much bigger the drag becomes. So by the time you get to 50 to 70 or seven, more than 70 percent, the tax taxes are taking away more than half of your returns. The bottom line there is if you're investing taxable money, okay, so you're not investing your pension fund, you're investing taxable money, and you're looking at mutual funds to invest in, take a look at their turnover ratios because high turnover ratios will cost you in terms of taxes and essentially will cost you in terms of after-tax returns. So tr taxes and transactions costs are kind of locked at the head. So if you ask me how to manage the taxes in your portfolio, I could always ask you to find a good tax lawyer, but rather than say that, on the investment front, I'll ask you to keep your trading to a minimum. Because the more you trade, the more taxes you're going to pay. Think about taxes when buying. So don't think about taxes after you bought the investment. Think about taxes before buying. Factor in the taxes when selling. Because when you sell, it's you might want to time your selling in such a way you minimize your taxes. If you're, if you're selling a stock on which you made a, mo a lot of money, try to team it up with selling a stock on which you've lost some money so that you can get the offset. And try not to invest just to avoid taxes because not only will that get you into trouble with the tax guy, but it's also a terrible way to invest. So if you're thinking about taxes, think about them in conjunction with trading because the two tend to go together. So in review then, when you think about, about what kind of returns you'll make on a particular philosophy or strategy, think through it because you get to spend only returns left over after taxes and after transactions costs. And as we've seen in this presentation, transactions costs can take away a big chunk of your value because they come in many forms. It's not just the brokerage cost. It's the spread between the bid price and the ask price, which can vary widely across companies. It can be the price impact you have when you trade, which will be larger if you're a bigger investor. And finally, there can be a cost to waiting, which is associated with transactions costs. So those costs can vary widely across stocks. And if your investment philosophy requires you to buy those stocks which have high costs, don't be surprised to see your actual returns lag your expect the returns you thought you would make. That's about it. Thank you very much for listening.